on the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. What's in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hannis, in this episode, we go back to our old friend Ian Squibbs, who's going to talk about one of the more peculiar Fortean photographs of our life and times. <laughs> Oh, Rossiter, I've always wondered that when you're here with me filming the studio, oh yes, yeah, uh, <coughs> who runs the Youth Outreach Centre uh, down in Brixton in your absence? Oh, you never worry about that, it's in very good hands. Yeah, I, 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 I let it be run by this man and he is a sweet distributor and he wears a flat cap, a raincoat and a tube of Smarties. He got puppies as well. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, my name's John Downs. I'm the director of an organisation called the Centre for Fortune Zoology, which if you haven't heard of it, is the English-speaking world's largest, and we like to think best, mystery animal research group. It was founded by me on the shores of Loch Ness 32 years ago, and is continuing to go from strength to strength. Every Saturday afternoon at 3 for about half an hour, and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 for about half that we bring you a miscellany of hard science, weird shit and surreality. What's surreality I hear you ask? Well why don't you have a word with the late Bertolt Brecht. Hello, I am the world famous dialectical playwright and composer Bertolt Brecht who died at the age of 58 in the mid-1950s in East Berlin, and I want to introduce you to the most famous dog in the world, the only dog who can sing talk songs written by me and Kurt Weil, the one and only Archie. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, a few weeks ago I did two interviews with our old friend Ian Squibbs. The first one we broadcast a couple of weeks ago, and here is the second. It's not even slightly cryptozoological, but the thing that is interesting about this is that a photograph was taken of what appears to be a solid object, and the photograph was identified as being something most peculiar and I think that we can all learn a lot from what Ian has to tell us in this particular segment. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, 
is back. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. It is the one and only Ian Squid. Good to be back on CFZ TV um, and uh, to delve into the annals of the unexplained once more. So today we're going to look at another 40 in classic. The infamous Solway Firth Spaceman photo. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. Let's begin. Mm -hmm. On the 23rd of May, 1964, Jim Templeton, a fireman, and amateur photographer from Carlisle, was having a day out with his wife, Annie, and his five-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, on Berg Marsh, situated near Berg by Sands, overlooking the Solway Firth in Cumberland, England. It was a pleasant afternoon, though Jim did notice that the cows and sheep that normally infested the field were away at the other end of the marsh, huddled together as though they were frightened by something. During the trip, Templeton took three photos of Elizabeth in a new dress with his Kodak SLR camera. A few days later, Templeton went to collect his photos from the chemist that had developed them. And uh, so this was before the days of digital camera. So this is what you used to have to do, wasn't it? Actually go physically to the chemist and pick up your photos. So that's where he, that's where he went. In passing, the chemist expressed his disappointment that some idiot had ruined what he believed to be the best shot of Jim's daughter. A puzzled Jim then looked at the photo in question. What he saw was the image of what appeared to be a tall humanoid figure clad in some kind of a space suit jutting out at an odd angle behind his daughter's head. Uh, Templeton was confused as neither he nor his wife had seen anything or anyone unusual on their walk. Um, but what was most perplexing was the fact that the spaceman only appeared in the middle picture of the three consecutive photos that he had shot and was missing in the first photo and the last. So what we'll do, John, let's have a look at the infamous Solway Firth Spaceman photo. Let's see what we've got there. Let's have a look at that then. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Upon first inspection, what we have is the photo of a nice little girl, um, and then you get struck by the eerie humanoid figure lurking behind her. The figure is large, appears to be clad in a white futuristic space-type outfit, complete with white helmet and black visor. However, a closer look at the figure shows the elbow, uh, the elbow of the arm is pointing towards the camera, which means what we're looking at is the back of the figure, which would rule out the possibility uh, that we're looking at a space helmet with a black visor looking towards the camera. We must be looking at the back of the head uh, or back of the helmet. Hoping to get to the bottom of the mystery, Templeton sent the picture back to Kodak, where it was extensively examined by trained professionals who found no signs of um, faulty film stock, tampering or hoax. Executives at Kodak were so intrigued by the image that they offered a reward of free film for a year to any person that could solve the mystery as to how the spaceman got into the picture. The reward remains unclaimed. Templeton also took the photo to the police in Carlisle, who examined it and said there was nothing suspicious about it. So, you know, that's a bit odd, isn't it? A strange thing to do, um, taking the photo to the police because there was a figure in the background. They've got murders to investigate. Come on, not look at Jim Templeton's holiday snaps. So, yeah, yeah it's true, though, isn't it? You know, what are you, what are, how peculiar. 
Anyway, a uh, local newspaper, the Cumberland News, picked up on the story, and within hours it spread all over the world. Strangely, the region where the shot was taken has a history of UFO activity. Many of the locals in the area believe that this is due to the Chapel Cross nuclear power plant uh, that operates nearby and can actually be seen in the background of Templeton's photo. A few weeks after the photo was taken, Jim was visited at his workplace by what only can be described as men in black. Yeah, here we go. Mm. According to Templeton, two men in dark suits pulled up at his fire station, where he worked, um, in a dark Jaguar car. The strange men referred to each other uh, by numbers instead of names, uh, claimed to be agents of Her Majesty's government. Some sources say that they refer to each other as number nine and number 11 though that is just a rumour. There's no actual substance in that. Um, the men in black asked Templeton to take them to the location where the photo was taken, so he did. Uh, during the five-mile drive to the marsh, Templeton was bombarded by a series of bizarre questions regarding uh, the weather, the behaviour of the birds and other animals on the day in question. Uh, they also asked Jim where he saw the second spaceman. When Jim tried to explain that uh, to the men that there was no second spaceman, they became vis visually aggressive. And when Jim arrived at the location, the men in black attempted to force Jim to confess uh, that he had uh, photographed nothing more than an ordinary man. When Templeton refused to make such an admission, the men became angry and stormed off, leaving Jim to walk five miles back to his work in the pouring rain. So, yeah. After this incident, Jim dismissed the two men as fraud, saying, uh, it all looks like a leg pull to me. I'm sure the men were not security agents. A second roll of film that Templeton had sent to Kodak for processing months later was returned with some of the negatives mysteriously missing. Templeton was forced to conclude uh, that they were confiscated by government agents because the film may have revealed something secret. Um, the tale took another strange turn when the editor of a Cumberland newspaper book requested to borrow the negative of the photo and sent it to other publications in Australia. It then emerged that on the very same day that Templeton took his picture, a rocket launch countdown was aborted at a rocket test facility in Woomera, Australia. The launch was halted when... Um, Two automatic security cameras caught a pair of large humanoid figures clad in what appeared to be white spacesuits walking around the launch pad. The launch area was then searched and nobody was found to be in the area. At the time of the launch, the Templeton photo had yet to reach Australia and the crew had no knowledge of, its Im of the image. Templeton described this incident as he heard it. They saw the two monitors. Somebody was in the firing area, and of course, the countdown was stopped. They searched the area. Nobody was to be found, not a soul, and it was put down to a technical fault. But it was exactly the same type of man, same dress, same figure, same size as the picture that was taken over in Berg Marsh. When Australian reporters asked to view the security camera footage taken at Woomera on, the, on May the 21st, they were informed that out of all the canisters of film that were taken during the entire Blue Streak project, the only canister missing was the one contained in the requested footage. The Woomera facility uh, has been the site of numerous UFO sightings and at least one more aborted launch uh, was due to what was described as a white being that was spotted in the security area and cameras picked this up. Eventually, the Blue Street rocket test was successfully launched on the 5th of June, 1964. What, if any, connection to the Cumberland Spaceman this has to do with Blue Streak remains a mystery to this day. 
Less than three weeks later, off the coast of California in Big Sur, another alien form was captured by a USAF team filming an Atlas rocket. Both the Atlas and the Blue Streak were intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs for short. The commanding officer of the mission captured footage of an alien ship beaming light to the tip of the rocket's warhead twice. When the footage was developed, two MIBs, men in blacks, questioned him. Were the aliens possibly attempting to stop the use of nuclear weapons? We can only survive. So how can all this be explained? Well, let's start with the fact that Templeton said he did not see anyone else in the frame at the time when he took the photo of his daughter. And the first time he saw the mystery figure was on the developed photo. So this can possibly be explained uh, by the type of camera Jim was using at the time. Templeton took the photo looking through a viewfinder of a Kodak SLR camera. This meant that he was only able to see 70% of the full frame of the photo. So, if a person, or in this case, a visitor from another planet, were to walk behind Elizabeth in the shot, then Jim would not have seen them through the view cup finder. And we can see this in the following illustration. We will have a look at the following illustration in the next picture there, John. Mm -hmm. So, put that up. So, as we can see, the full frame is the blue box. And to look uh, look at this through the viewfinder, you would only see what's in the red box. So this would probably be expl explain why Templeton did not see anyone else in the frame at the time when he took the photo of his daughter. So theories as to who or what the Solway Firth spaceman is have varied over the years. It has been suggested that uh, it's someone in a bio suit who is carrying out some sort of radioactive work for the nearby Chapel Cross power station. It has also been suggested that it's a, um, it's a beekeeper, perhaps, in full beekeeping garb in pursuit of a stray bee. <laughs> yeah, could be. Could uh, be? It could well be, pardon the pun. And, of course, it's been suggested that it is a visitor from outer space, though it's a bit of a coincidence that um, space suits that are used by aliens uh, are um, very similar to the ones that were used by NASA um, at, the, at around the time that the photo was taken. Another theory is that Jim faked the photo. He had a bit of a reputation as a practical joker, you know, a bit of a joker in the pack. Um, and just weeks before the Spaceman event, uh, Jim had tricked his friends with a fake five-pound note that he had created using his photographic skills. So you can't rule him out of the uh, equation, too. Did, Jem did Templeton fake the photo for a prank? Um, in 1997, photo expert Robert Green of Bradford University studied the picture, and he concluded that the photo had been modified um, using the superimposition uh, technique, probably similar to what Doc Shields uh, created with the uh, Loch Ness Muppet photo, similar type of technique, perhaps. Another theory says that Jim's friends um, in the local photo lab might have mocked up the photo in a way of getting back to Jim for the practical jokes that he had played on them. So my own theory myself is it is, in fact, um, 1970s stuntman, and um, all-round head case, Evil Knievel. So what we can do, if we go to the next picture there, let's just see, I've done a comparison myself, and we can see uh, Evil there in his garb and the spaceman. So it could well be the same person. Or maybe what it could be is, um, it could be the Stig from Top Gear as well, the, uh, the Top Gear program. And we can look at that photo. If you look at the next photo there, there's the Stig and the Solway Firth Spaceman side by side, looking very similar. So yeah, it could be, or basically anyone in a in a white motorcycle outfit could could have been it. So, but you get the idea with that. So yeah. Anyway, the most common theory 
is that the spaceman is in fact Jim Templeton's wife, Annie. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the, the uh, presentation, today's presentation, it was mentioned that Jim Templeton did in fact take three photos of his daughter on Solway Firth that day. So what did the other two photos show? So what we can do, we can look at um, one of the other two photos. We go to the next picture there. Have a look at that later on. And um, what we can see here, there's Elizabeth holding the flowers. And to the left of her is Jim's wife, Annie, wearing a light blue dress. And we can see that quite clearly. Um, is it possible that Jim's wife walked into the frame when he took the photo and over a blurry um, overexposure of her light dress, her figure in general gave the impression of a spacesuit complete with white helmet. Um, could her dark hair give the impression of a dark visor over the face? Though we do know, looking at the that we are looking at the back of the picture, obviously that was always been apparent because of the elbow um, location. Close-up analysis of the two figures do show similarities of the blue dress that Annie was wearing uh, and the space suit. So what we can do, John, if we look at the next picture there, there's a few side-by-side uh, -side comparisons. We can see, you know, various lines on the um, on the space suit plus his wife's um, blue dress side-by-side -side, and, you know, the creases, arm lines, etc kind of correspond is this what's happened um most notably the sleeve and necklines and jim's wife did have short dark hair which would co correspond with the so-called visor after seeing the second photo suspicion then arises as jim said that he took three photos we have seen two of them but the third has never been published and is nowhere to be found in the public domain is there something revealing on the third photo that Jim did not want us to see? It remains a mystery. Whatever the famous photo shows, it has become commonplace in Fortean media over the years, and Jim would never shy away from talking about the photo and seemed to enjoy the attention he got from it. In 1996, the Dunfries Courier ran an article on the photo and arranged for Jim and his now grown up daughter re to re re revisit the site. And we can see, if we look at the next picture there, John, we can see uh, some years later, the pier on Solway Firth. And um, there we go, there's an, an older Jim and his grown up daughter. So the Jim is 76 in that photo and uh, Elizabeth is, seven, is uh, 37. Elizabeth told the newspaper, we got a lot of hassle from people like you, the press, uh, but it was really, I was really young and can't remember much. I think it was somebody from another planet. It's pretty selfish of us to think that we are the only intelligent form of life. So that's what his daughter said. So Jim sadly passed away in 2011, uh, age 91. So he had a good innings. Um, so basically, there we go. There's a review of the curious case of the Solway Firth Spaceman. A fascinating tale. I'm sure you'll agree. So, is the figure in the photo a spaceman or merely Jim Templeton's wife? We don't know. All we do know is that the truth is out there. Thank you. So, what do you think? What do you think the answer is? Well, I think I think it's a human. Um, the figure is humanoid. It's you know I I think it's highly likely it's Jim's wife. That seems to be the most uh, plausible explanation. Um, you know, our visit our our alien life forms basically exactly the same as humans. Mm, that's the that's a question there because it's not a little green man, is it? This is like a normal regular size earth human in the photo isn't it it's not uh it's not a different form of life and also the spacesuit being worn is very similar to the spacesuits that um that uh we use on earth so yeah what, what do, do you, you think john 
The thing that puzzles me slightly is the Men in Black story, because it sounds very much like one of the things chronicled by John Keel. Mm. Well, Jim did say he thought it was a leg pull, and you do get UFO people, um, you know, doing all sorts of things like that. So, and I actually saw some. Yes, there's a comic where I live nearby. There's a comic book or, you know, comic book shop. And there was a guy in there dressed as Darth Vader, complete with lifesavers and all sorts. But yeah, so you don't know. How do you know it wasn't Darth Vader? He had other people with him, and I think one of them was his girlfriend, and she was an Earth woman. And um, also, I did see him with his mask up as well. But that's pretty conclusive. I yeah, think. but yeah, no, but it's just a good, it's a good story. I think the Solway Firth. It's something from the sixties. You know, it's one of those things, isn't it? Um, easily explained, I would think. But you know, it's built up this story around it. The photo itself is good. I must admit, it's one of those thing, one of those photos, pre digital camera, you know. Yeah, so it's just enjoyable to look into the tail and see what you think. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe. Follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell, or else you won't be told when the next show's going to be. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another show. I hope you enjoyed it. Originally, Richard and I had intended to do a whole string of interesting whale stories that we'd come across recently. But I completely underestimated how long Ian's piece about the Solway Firth Spaceman photograph, or should I say, Spaceman, photograph took and it was so fascinating I truly couldn't bear to cut it. So the whales will be postponed for another day and I just want to say thank you to everybody who's helped this episode which really has been Richard Freeman and Ian Squibbs, two delightful people and of course the late Bertolt Brecht. And for those of you who don't know, the original song, Moon of Alabama, is one of only two songs in English in Bertolt Brecht's great opera, The Fall and Rise of the City of Mahogany. Excellent piece of music, I recommend it to everybody. And it's been recorded by David Bowie and by The Doors and I'm sure all sorts of other people, in fact I know all sorts of other people, I just can't remember who they are offhand. Before we go, I want to welcome a new member to the CFZ family. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to meet Reggie. He is a charming young man who was born at lunchtime on the day that we were editing this show. So. Welcome to the world, Reggie. Reggie is, by the way, Miss Maxine's latest grandson. And no doubt he, like all the other junior members of the CFZ family, will find themselves dressed up in peculiar costumes and running around the countryside so we can make more peculiar bits for this show. I'd also like to say a big thank you to my producer, Louis, and to Karen and Judy who have been keeping the home bus fires burning in a spectacular manner. So I'll be back on Wednesday. What are we going to do on Wednesday? Well I'm not sure of the details yet but it is almost certainly going to be Richard Freeman and me with another book review. 
which means a quick, brief interlude from Kara and the monster called Ralph. And I'll be back on Saturday. What's happening on Saturday? Well, I think it's quite likely that we're going to be talking about whales. And whilst we're in the mood for something nautical, I think we're going to have Ronan back talking about sea serpents. No, we're not. We're going to have Ronan back talking about merfolk. Why on earth did I say sea serpents? I really am becoming a silly old sod. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you again. Because, are you ready, Mr. McQuinnan? If you're there watching, I'll be seeing you.